this uh, last session uh, of the conference. Uh, the session is titled Grassroots Mobilizations and Political Ideologies in Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, we have four uh, presenters for this session, and what I'm going to do is just go ahead and introduce the first speaker and the first paper, and then uh, we'll obviously do the rest uh, right before we'll do the introductions of the rest as we go along. Uh, our uh, first paper presentation is titled uh, Lebanese Power Structure and Its Impact on the Effectiveness of Grassroots Mobilizations, Lessons from the Labor Movement. And uh, we have Rosanna Tufaro. She's a PhD candidate at the University Ka Fukari, uh, Fusari? Fuscari. Fuscari, sorry, and uh, Venice, Italy. My Italian isn't very good. And uh, actually, we're welcoming Rosanna back because she did her uh, research uh, while she was here. And so we'll get to hear a little bit about uh, her uh, research topic today uh, after lots and lots of work while she was here. So with that, can I, you have 20 minutes, and we'll have uh, questions at the very end. Um, thank you. First of all, good morning to everyone, and thanks to AUB and Princeton for the invitation and you all for your presence. Now, since the time that we have, uh, it's not that much, I will go straight with the frameworking uh, of, my uh, of uh, the subject of my presentation. Now, uh, between 2000, late 2011 and 2014, Lebanon has witnessed a, a wave of labor conflict has not seen for a long time. Uh, waved, which was produced by the parallel development of three particularly long-standing grassroots mobilization. First, the mobilization of uh, Spinney's uh, employees for uh, rising salaries, better work working conditions, and the right to unionize. Second, the dispute of ADL, uh, that is to say the National uh, Electricity Company, uh, daily workers for a permanent employment. And third, the dispute of public employees for the adjustment of their salaries and their salary scale. Uh, now, uh, while having been quite different to each other on a number of points of views, all those disputes have all shared the common characteristics to have uh, used as privileged means to ask and obtain the addressing of their demands, the recourse to direct action and radical mobilization. Uh, strategic choice, which was strictly related uh, to their second common characteristics, that is to say, the lack uh, of, uh, a re of a labor union to rely on as main defender of their rights. Uh, now, uh, such a strategic uh, strategy has certainly revealed successful in the case of Spinney's workers that by the end of 2012 had been able to see all their demands satisfied, union included. Uh, as for the case of ADL daily workers and public employees instead, uh, if um, the recourse to grassroots mobilization has certainly <clears throat> revealed crucial to push the government to take charge of their demands. On the other side, it has not revealed sufficient uh, to achieve a success. Uh, in fact, whereas ADL has obtained nothing more than a promise of, uh, of hiring that until today has not been absolutely satisfied. On the other side, uh, public employees have been left at stake waiting for the financial resources to cover the cost of their salary adjustments to be found. Now, the main justification adopted by Lebanese uh, political class for such uh, a wait-and-see attitude uh, has been represented by the two years of presidential vacuum and so institutional paralysis that the country uh, has recently experienced. Uh, nevertheless, if we go and give a closer look at the dialectic relations which occurred alongside the mobilization between workers' claims and, uh, and actions, of course, and the government and parliament demands, what we can see is that what in the reality of facts has represented the major obstacle for the success, for the success of the mobilization has been represented first by the influence on, of uh, capital on Lebanese political decision making, um, 
influence, which is strictly which is derived, deriving from first the substantial coincidence between political and business class, uh, and second by the growing dependency of the Lebanese state on the uh, banking sector uh, due to its uh, increasing indebtedness. Uh, and second, the game of competition and negotiation among the various political parties for the sectarian allocation and the control of the distribution of the state services, workplaces, and so forth, which representing one of the main characteristics of the functioning of Lebanese political sectarian system. Uh, two elements that represent nothing more than the two major elements regulating the articulation of Lebanese power relation. Um, now, what I want to investigate with you today is precisely this, the, this dialectic uh, uh, in, um, interaction for those two last disputes, uh, because I think that it's particularly insightful uh, to both provide us um, the measure of when, how, and why such an articulation represents um, a huge mortgage for the success of grassroots mobilization in the country, and second, because it indirectly provides us the, the, the measure of, of how such an articulation represent, equally represents a major mortgage for um, the achievement of a greater social justice in the country. Now, let's now start with the investigation of public and place disputes. Uh, public and place disputes start, uh, that represent one third of Lebanese labor, labor force uh, began to mobilize uh, on January 2012. Uh, after that, uh, the parliament decided to allow, to allow salary rises to private employees alone. Uh, and witnessed among their main claims a 121% wage increase, that is to say, a wage increase equivalent to um, <coughs> Uh, the rise in the cost of living since the last uh, wage increase dating back to 1996, uh, the adjustments of their salary scale, and a fair distribution of uh, the overtime working hours and their remuneration. Now, <clears throat> the evolution of the, of the dispute uh, can be divided into three distinct moments. Uh, a first moment stretching from January to September 2012 that witnesses uh, the ability of public employees uh, to turn, thanks to their grassroots mobilization, um, the balance of power in their favor. And particularly after that, in June of that year, they decided to adopt as extreme weapon of pressure vis-a-vis -vis the government the boycott of the supervising and the marking of the school final examination, which ran in parallel with the general strike in all the public offices. Uh, pressure that in the, uh, that, appeared that in the end, uh, even if uh, temporarily, reached their goal. In fact, on September 1st, uh, Lebanese cabinet approved both a, dra a draft law addressing um, the majority of public employees' demands and uh, a package of additional measures to finance it. But it's, it's precisely from this moment that the course of the events uh, drastically changes. Uh, in fact, um, Lebanese government has identified as main sources of funding of uh, the manoeuvre uh, fines, uh, a number of additional fines on real estate and on the interest rates on bank deposits. Furthermore, allowing uh, the wage increase uh, demanded by the workers, it would have pushed the minimum wage of uh, public employees up to $580 per month versus a minimum wage for the private sector of uh, $450 alone. And this provoked the immediate opposition of Lebanese business class that immediately started to directly inter intervene in the dispute, becoming the f de facto the third uh, actor, uh, and so radically changed its course. Uh, in particular, uh, Lebanese business class is a representative organism named Lebanese Economic Organization, started to organize a number of public initiatives running in, par in parallel with the public employees one, uh, wherein the st they started to treat uh, the more and more explicitly uh, Lebanese politician of massive uh, mass dismissals and, above all, the freezing of uh, uh, 
uh, any further bank financing of the state deficit in case um, of a parliamentary approval of such a draft. Uh, as you can see, a very invasive uh, attitude of uh, LEO uh, that in effect paid back. In fact, when on March um, 2013, the, the draft law was finally sent to the parliament to be voted, after that, an ongoing strike uh, of public employees was paralyzing the country since one month. Uh, in effect, the, the draft that was presented was a total betrayal of the former one. In fact, together with the elimination of a number of formerly allowed benefits, uh, it introduces sources of funding, new taxes on consumer goods, and above all, uh, was exploited to impose a number of controversial measures explicitly in favor of uh, the business class that otherwise would have not been voted, such as the reducing on, uh, of the legal fines on the occupation of the public uh, beachfront. Now, the day after, the government of uh, Najib Mikati fell, uh, temporarily freezing the dispute until, on the February of the following year, a new government was appointed. Unluckily, however, the die, the die was clearly already cast. Uh, in fact, uh, in the March of the... Uh, if, on the one side, the, the new uh, draft elaborated by the DOC Parliamentary Commission ap appointed by the new government to find a solution to the dispute was nothing more than a reiteration of the former uh, year one. Um, <coughs> Uh, furthermore, when uh, public employees record to yet another boycott of the school examinations, uh, the, the government answer with an eloquently, unanimous, unanimously approved decision to arbitrary issue to all the exam candidates their certificates, in, depriving in this way uh, public employees or their, of their stronger uh, weapon of pressure, and so leading uh, the whole dispute to the dead end in which it's still trapped. As for, uh, in the case uh, of ADL daily workers instead, it's the former allocation game uh, among the Lebanese major political parties that pay, played a major role for the shipwreck of the mobilization. Now, uh, any other daily workers' disputes started in the spring of 2012. Uh, after that, the three private um, companies to which uh, the electricity company had just uh, outsourced the distribution services announced that they will have reemployed only the 30% of them. Now, to understand the political games underlying and uh, directly influencing the evolution of this dispute, it is necessary to make a short diversion. Um, uh, in the post-war years, as a result of a mm, broader process of privatization and spending review of all the public companies derived by the adoption, uh, by both the adoption of the neoliberal policies of uh, Prime Minister Rafiq El Hariri and the details of a number of um, international economic organizations. Um, all the public companies underwent a general process of uh, spending review that in the case of ADL, uh, of ADL resulted in a massive restructuring uh, of the employment uh, structure of the company, and particularly in the progressively massive substitution of full-time workers with daily workers one. Restructuring uh, that uh, has been simultaneously exploited by the new political parties that came to power after uh, the end of the civil war um, to reinforce their constituency building that so uh, the <coughs> by um, recruiting on a clientelistic base such 
daily workers. Uh, clientelization that in the case uh, of uh, Adele has been mostly um, championed by uh, the AMAL movement. Now, this provoked uh, uh, a double distor uh, an important double distortion in ideal labor re uh, relation, uh, which works on, on two levels. The first one, uh, at, the, at the level of state company relation, uh, and consists in the state delegation of the management of its labor relation with ideal workers to the political leaders directly involved in the latter's hiring. Uh, and, and the second one, working at the level of company workers' relations, uh, consisting in both the workers' institutionalization of their political pan patterns as main political, if not sole, political referee, and also uh, in the, the introjection of the idea of political loyalty as a main means to guarantee their job continuity. And in effect, the labor relation in ADL had been able to find uh, uh, a balance thanks to an implicit uh, tacit uh, agreement between uh, daily workers and political patrons uh, whose main safeguard, safeguard clause was represented uh, that by the guarantee of, uh, precisely by the guarantee of a job con uh, continuity in the perspective of a full-time uh, uh, hiring uh, in exchange for political loyalty. Uh, trust pact that was Totally, disrupt, totally and suddenly disrupted when the three subcontracting companies announced uh, their decision. So, paving the way to the open protest. Now, as for the case of um, public employees, uh, in the first phase uh, of the mobilization was characterized, he also in this case, by the ability of um, daily workers during the balance of power in their favor. In fact, on July 2nd, uh, the Lebanese parliament approved uh, a draft law addressing all the workers' demands. However, the unorthodox modalities through which uh, such an agreement was approved uh, provoked the strong discontent of uh, all the major Christian parties, and particularly of the Free Patriotic Movement, which is the party of the, at the time, Ministry of Energy, that started to boycott in a sign of protest uh, all the, uh, of the uh, subsequent uh, parliamentary and cabinet sessions, so uh, engendering a long phase of institutional paralysis. Um, in effect, uh, what happened during the approval, in effect, uh, when the um, draft allowed, arrived, to, uh, had been able to be uh, approved, thanks to a number of stretches by Nabi Berri, which is the, lead, the parliament speaker and the leader of the AMAL movement, uh, a number of stresses on the parliamentary procedures that, while not illegal, uh, de facto imposed uh, such a draft law on the cabinet as a fait accompli. Uh, now, the institutional paralysis derived by the Christian party boycott of the parliamentary and cabinet session pushed the government to revisit, of course, the draft bill. Uh, but the, re the process of revision, uh, quite eloquently, I'd say, uh, took the shape of a number of private talks uh, outside the institutional buildings and without any representative of daily workers between uh, the AMO movement and the Free Patriotic movement. Uh, talks uh, in which, for Termol, it seems clear from the very first moment that the major goal uh, of, uh, of the two political factions was to maximize their own uh, political gain, uh, their own political gains, rather than find a, a real solution to um, uh, daily workers' problems. And this emerged clearly in the political agreement the, that was finally found as a, a solution to the dispute. Uh, <coughs> temporary agreement, uh, political agreement that in fact, um, by just establishing a temporary, temporary employment of all the daily workers by the subcontractors, uh, de facto, uh, if 
on the one side, totally betrayed workers' expectation. On the other side, they reached, um, <coughs> uh, allowed to free patriotic movement the achievement uh, of his main goal, which was um, forbid the full-time hiring of all those workers, and to the Amal movement, the restoration of the promise of the perspective of a permanent employment, which represented uh, the necessary precondition for an eventual restoring um, of the political loyalty of uh, his former constituency to be recreated. Now, uh, this quick overview has showed us how, in uh, as um, has given us two concrete examples on how, in effect, uh, that the current articulation of Lebanese power relations represents a major obstacle for the effectiveness of grassroots mobilization. But more importantly, it has shown us how the state keeps on being the, main, the privileged terrain for the uh, hegemony of the political elites and of the Lebanese economic elites um, to be reproduced. Um, besides, uh, Antonio Gramsci opened one of my favorites prison notebooks stating that uh, the historical unity of the dominant classes realizes in the state. And uh, the only way I feel to conclude this, uh, this presentation is that unlikely in Lebanon today's uh, such a unity has never been as strong. Thank you. And sorry for this injection of nihilism. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Jaber Sleiman, and he will be speaking uh, about the uh, title of the paper's Access to Justice in a Displaced Community, the case of a Palestinian refugee camp in southern Lebanon. Uh, I think you can switch. Good evening, and thanks for the organizer. Uh, the outline, the contents of my, my study. So, to start with, the study rationale, uh, as defined by the World Bank, poverty is a multi-dimensional social phenomenon. The poor often lack adequate food, shelter, education, and health that keep them from leading the kind of life that everyone values. This description of poverty and the poor is very much characteristic to the case of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. This case study investigates the correlation of poverty with the lack of access to the Lebanese sector of justice in a displaced community, focusing on one of the poorest refugee camps in Lebanon, Burj al uh, Burj al-Shamali, entire area southern Lebanon. Maybe the specificity of this study is the, the duality of vulnerability and its ramifications on access to justice because uh, this study uh, 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 deals with a refugee community, not st stable community, which the population, uh, in which population maybe in theory, if not the practice, are enjoying citizenship rights. So this is the specificity of the study. Well, the root causes of poverty here is not only the socio-economic condition they live in, but the original displacement from 1948. The methodology of the study mainly relied on primary data collection, a major focus group, discussion group composed of 12 persons representing um, different group ages and uh, backgrounds, in addition to nine in-depth interviews representing different cases, three criminal cases, and the three personal status cases, and the three dispute over property cases. 
The primary data was supplemented by secondary data that highlighted the legal framework which governs the lives of Palestinians in Lebanon and provided the poverty line of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Palestinian refugees who reside in, to, to move to the legal framework, starting with international protection, Palestinian refugees who reside in the UNRWA five areas of operation are not entitled to benefit from the protection provided by the UNCR and the 1951 Convention as long as they receive assistance from UNRWA, as known this according to Article 1D of the Convention. The refugees failing within the UNRWA definition of Palestine refugees, not refugees, are entitled to receive education, health, uh, health, social services, which could be considered as a type of a relief protection, but not a legal protection. Uh, regarding the regional protection, the protocol on the treatment of Palestinians adopted by the Arab League Council of Ministers in 1965, and known as the Casablanca Protocol, um, addresses the issue of temporal protection for Palestinian refugees in the Arab host countries. Lebanon was among the Arab states that have ratified this protocol, subject to reservation in respect to its first three articles pertaining to the right to work and freedom of residence and movement. But the scholars debate that the scope of protection included in this protocol is very much narrower than the scope protection included in the 1951 Convention. Um, when it comes to the Lebanese legislation, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are dealt with as foreigners, uh, deprived of almost all basic human rights and subjected to various forms of marginalization, spatial marginalization, institutional and economic. Unlike most liberal democracies where civil rights are linked to permanent residency in Arab worlds, including Lebanon, the right to citizenship is considered as the primary right from which other civil rights and entitlements are derived. In August 2010, the Lebanese parliament passed two laws pertaining to the Palestinian refugees' rights to, right to work, the law number 129 and to uh, social security, law number 108, but they are not enforced till now because there is a lack of what's so called implementing decrees. Till now there were no implementing decrees to implement these. So the situation has not changed since uh, to, uh, August 2010. A uh, property line uh, profile, according to the IUB and UNRWA survey of 2010 and 2015, uh, the next one, the general poverty rates have remained uh, the same after, the, after five years at 65%. Using the multidimensional poverty index, MPI, around quarter of PRL, 24%, were found to be multidimensionally poor in 2015, and 2.1% were severely multidimensionally poor. Uh, the PRL monthly per capita spending is under half the average of spending of the Lebanese at 193 USD compared to 429 USD respectively. The PRL unemployment rate in 2015 stands at 23% recording a significant increase from 2010 rate at of, of, of 8%. The area in which Burj al-Shamali is located alone accounted for more than 28% of all the poor in 2015. It's interesting that the, the percentage was um, 32, I think, in uh, a survey of two, 2010. The camp population perceptions on poverty. In general, perceptions and uh, definitions of poverty and its causes vary by various social and economic context. context. 
despite the fact that poverty is being a material in nature, it has psychological, emotional dimensions, effects such as distress, insecurity, shame, helplessness, powerlessness, humiliation, and marginalization. As refugees, our poverty is the result of displacement and discrimination towards Palestinians by the Lebanese successive government, one refugee said. We have been living in the camp since in Nakba, and we are always preferred to stay poor than to steal or beg in order to maintain our dignity. Poverty, mishaib, not shameful, it's a better to be poor than to be without dignity, other refugees stated. The importance of education as a strategy to combat poverty was stressed by the majority of the participants, even if this is done or accomplished at the expense of their other pressing needs. Uh, when, when it's come to the investigated cases, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are, th there are three criminal cases, three civil cases, and three ownership cases. These cases will be referred to uh, in the analysis, in the forthcoming analysis. Findings and conclusions. The refugee camps a space of suspended justice. Palestinian refugees camps are envisaged by the Lebanese security apparatus as security islands beyond the reach of law and space of suspended justice. One of the main challenges facing law enforcement in the camps is the Lebanese state's non-recognition or delegitimizing of the local self-autonomous Palestinian structures inside the camps, like the popular committees which were created according to Cairo Agreement in 1969, <coughs> that this agreement was abrogated by, uh, unilaterally by the Lebanese uh, government in 1987. Lack of adequate protection. The imbalance between the Palestinian refugees' rights and their obligations under the Lebanese law renders them subject to discrimination and exploitation when they access the Lebanese judicial system as some of the investigated cases studies has shown, have shown. Legal assistance. Refugees and asylum seekers in Lebanon generally have access to courts. The Lebanese law offers legal aid for uh, nationals, Article 425 of the Decree Number 90 of 1983. However, Article 426 of the same dec uh, decree subsidizes legal assistance to foreigners under the reciprocity condition, which means that Palestinian refugees are excluded from such kind of assistance because the lack of a Palestinian state, of course. Um, there is a pressing need, as the participant stress in interviews, focus group, for a pro bono uh, oriented institution able to provide legal assistance for Palestinian refugees, given that some Lebanese uh, 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 associations like Justice and Mercy, Ajem, Terdizom, Kafa, and the Frontier provide from time to time a very limited assistance, especially for detained children, non-IDs, and divorced mothers. There is, in addition to the narrow scope of legal assistance provided by some international NGOs, like the Norwegian Refugee Council and the Danish Refugee Council and UNRWA. I'll, a little bit, I'll uh, highlight the UNRWA project, Legal Aid. In February 2000, uh, 2011, the UNRWA uh, launched a legal aid project for Palestinian refugees. The aim of this project is to enhance access to justice through referral of Palestinian refugees in need to legal representation by accredited Lebanese lawyers. However, this important project has its own limitations in terms of eligibility. Only standard civil uh, litigations shall be, uh, I mean civil uh, uh, cases, shall be uh, admitted, excluding criminal cases. The beneficiaries are also rest are restricted to Palestinian refugees who are registered with the directorate or the foreign political uh, or Palestinian refugees uh, affairs within the Ministry of the Interior. Thus, the non-IDs who are in most need of legal assistance are excluded from this target group. 
Now move to alternative mechanism of justice. Palestinian refugees in Lebanon have low confidence in the Lebanese judiciary and court system and have a limited access to the formal justice sector. Override this situation, Palestinian refugees try to use alternative customary mechanisms of uh, dispute resolution through approaching community leaders, religious persons such as imams with the mosque, NGO, local governance structures like popular committees, security committees, factions, and village association. Village association is uh, a structure that was created based on the pre-1948 uh, Palestine uh, peasantry community. Every village, most of the village are united together and uh, organized such kind of village, uh, village association that play a role in, in such cases. The case of Burjil Barajan reveals that the Lebanese factions and neighboring municipalities uh, also have a role to play in mediating and resolving disputes between the camps and its surroundings. It's, it's north knowing that in uh, 1994, a few thousand of Palestinians in Burj Shamali were get nationalized. They get the Lebanese nationality, but they are still living in the camp. And they are still consider them consider themselves as uh, refugees. So there is a good relation between the Burj Shamali camp and the neighboring municipality of Burj Shamali. And even there, two, uh, two of the camp's population are now in the, uh, were elected in the, uh, the, the Burj Shamali municipality, are members of the municipal council of Burj Shamali. It's quite misleading to claim that such an autonomous and arbitrary system of customary justice could substitute the formal sector of justice or totally compensate its limitation. Rather, it's an attempt to fill the gaps in the system and a mere, it's a mere coping mechanism or strategies with additional difficulties in assessing justice services. Uh, when alternative customary mechanisms are used, briefly, uh, uh, it's meaningless to use it in the dispute over employment because most of the Palestinian labor force are uh, employed in the informal sector, formal market. Regarding the disputes over property, also the uh, law, the amended law of 2001 banned the acquisition of of real estate property of Palestine, and so also they're hopeless to go to the court uh, to, to resolve such kind of disputes. Remaining the personal cases, of course, uh, Palestinians go to the Islamic courts like the Lebanese, but the implementation of the Islamic courts, if it's alimony or custody or that, uh, lack a, a tool of implementation in the camps because there is no uh, one. Uh, unified reference in the camps to implement this kind of rules. Uh, the Lebanese uh, judiciary system was uh, described by the World Bank as in a crisis due to the limited availability of legal and aid public defender programs, high court costs, and large sectors of the population in need of legal representation. As for the Lebanese judiciary system, as envisaged by Palestinian population in the camp, it's characterized by a number of features, including corruption, bribery, and trading of cases between lawyers, political and sectarian bias of some judges, uh, bureaucracy, crowdedness of cases before the courts. However, it's true that these features affect both Lebanese and Palestinians, but they disadvantage Palestinians more than Lebanese. I'll end up with the recommendations calling upon the Lebanese government to grant Palestinian refugees in Lebanon a separate legal status, distinguishing them from other foreigners based on their prolonged residency, uh, afford them uh, the same legal representation as nationals regardless of the state reciprocity condition, calling upon UNRWA to extend the scope of its legal and project, uh, illegal aid project and strengthening its counseling component and advocacy component and calling upon you and relevant bodies and international human rights organization to support Palestinians in Lebanon to create an independent pro bono institution with the aim of enhancing access to justice for Palestinian reasons. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, our next speaker is uh, Baria Asinno. She is a PhD candidate from the University of uh, Texas in Austin. And the uh, paper is titled Lebanese Ideology as a Driver of Sectarianism. Not a PhD candidate, I just finished my first year. So. Abruk. Okay, so um, thank you, Ryan, for the for the introduction. About my notes, I don't know how to have them without um, sharing them with you. Oh. Oh, is it the mirroring setup? Yes. Okay, so it's not going to work. Oh, there you go. Okay. So um, I, the title is not very representative of, of what I'm going to uh, talk about, but uh, I did not change it, uh, although I changed the content of the presentation. Um, this is work in progress, uh, which means I really would appreciate your um, feedback, criticism, and I take them uh, seriously. Uh, I'm interested in political ideology and sectarianism in Lebanon. and. Uh, uh, the, the one thing I'm interested in is uh, variations in level of sector, sectarianization between Lebanese groups. For example, the level of sectarianization of Shias compared to that of Sunnis, compared to that of maybe uh, Christians. I define sectarianization not only between Sunnis and Shias, but also between all three different groups. Um, to this end, I have uh, used uh, very uh, um, um, specific um, uh, conceptualizations of political ideology and sectarianism to be able to uh, uh, gauge um, the level of um, uh, within sect variation. So um, there is um, an agreement uh, among scholars uh, in social science that sectarianism is on the rise in in the Middle East, and that is uh, Islamic sectarianization. And um, a, lot of, a lot of scholarship, uh, recent scholarship, has uh, contributed to our um, uh, understanding of what sectarianization, sectarianism is, especially Lebanese sectar sectarianism. Um, they uh, offer explanations such as uh, the work of Melanie Kemet, uh, political, economical, and historical uh, explanations. Uh, what they don't offer is um, uh, they deny agency to sect members. And I have put direct into brackets because um, Melanie, for example, talks about, um, about uh, activism of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, s s people within their own sect. And that is uh, some kind of agency, but it is I see it as indirect to uh, the, the, the sectarianization or sectarianism. So I am uh, aiming at a different um, uh, type of uh, agency. Uh, this work also treats sect members as equal and sectarianism as homogenous. And they don't explain what I'm interested in, which is within sect variation in sectarianism. I have an Apple computer, so. Mm -hmm. So what is the puzzle? Um, in Lebanon, why do some sect in-group members develop more sectarian bias than others? So I'm interested in the difference within the same sect. And what I suggest is that different sect members have different ideological predispositions depending on where they fit on the ideological spectrum. So how do I define ideology? I conceptualize ideology as residing within the individual and not outside the individual. So it's not the ism that is without, uh, outside the individual. It is something that gives agency, um, whether, um, um, whether uh, conscious or subconscious agency, so that, the, like uh, John Joss defined it, uh, to choose between idea elements or or statements that appeal to them and that satisfy their psychological needs, motives, and desire. 
So um, I also define sect as ethnicity. So sect, of course, is a branch of a subgroup um, or, or a subgroup of a major religious group like Islam or Christianity. But most importantly, I minimally define it as descent base. It's socially constructed, heterogeneous, fluid, and can be politicized. What does that say about um, my study? It basically says that sex can have two or more subgroups and that these subgroups politicize differently and hence have different ideologies. So um, sectarianism, as opposed to sect, um, is um, a type of ethnocentrism that refers to uh, a strong self of group self-importance and self-centeredness. And ethnic, uh, ethnocentric uh, sectarianism is uh, a subset of ethno uh, ethnocentrism and refers to a whole cluster of ideas, beliefs, demonology about religious uh, differences, which are used to make religion as a social marker, to assign different attributes to various religious groups, and to make derogatory remarks about the other. So what is political ideology then? Um, I use Goering's um, um, conceptualization of political ideology. It's also very minimally defined. I don't use ideology the way um, other, um, maybe a psychology use it like this, and American politics use um, uh, ideology um, um, in this manner, but I haven't seen it used in the Lebanese context this way. So um, ideology is defined as minimally as a set of idea elements or statements bound together coherently, so they should make sense together. And he proposes the right and left spectrum as, one, uh, as a one-dimensional way to gauge the degree of coherence among these idea elements. So looking at it this way, sectarianism becomes a subset of um, Lebanese political ideology because, as we said earlier, they are coherent regarding sex and how they look at each other. Um, uh, what's the relationship of ethnocentrism with the right and left dimension? So Duckett uh, uh, says that ethnocentrism is a major facet that underlies and infuses the, the liberal conservative ideological dimension, and that the left tends to reject ethnocentrism and embrace openness, tolerance, and diversity, and the right tends to favor a much more close and ethnocentric position. So um, what are the sub-questions that I uh, intend to um, answer with um, the study that I am doing in order to answer the major question of my, um, of my paper. And um, they, they are four, actually. And um, the first one is, uh, is there intrasect ideological fragmentation within every sect, the, the Sunnis, the Christians, and the Shias? And what are the most shared intrasect viewpoints? the sub-ideologies of each subgroup, and uh, uh, where do subgroups fit on the right-left uh, dimension? So are, are some subgroups within each sex more to the right? Are some uh, subgroups more to the left? And the fourth one is uh, different because instead of uh, analyzing the data that I am collecting, as uh, a Sunni data or Shia data or Christian data, I'm compiling everything together and I'm analyzing it as a Lebanese data. And by doing so, I'm seeing where Lebanese groups, all sect combines, fit on the spectrum. So the methodology I'm using is called Q methodology. It is subjective, rank ordering of prejudiced ideological statement on a normal curve. I know it's a lot of words, but it will become clearer uh, in the next slide. It's subjective because uh, the participant is rank ordering the statements compared to one another. So this is the, the subjective part. It's prejudiced because every uh, statement is strong because it needs to elicit feelings for the uh, participant to place them on the normal curve and their ideological statement. It also allows us to bridge between qualitative research done on Lebanon and the quantitative research done on, uh, done on ideology in, for example, the American uh, politics literature. It also allows us to uh, circumvent the social desirability bias, because I I'll explain to you uh, in the next slide how. And it provides an x-ray of how important ideological variables um, fit in the ideological uh, the ideology. 
It also um, uses an inductive, eductive, and abductive reasoning. So it's not only qualitative or quantitative, it's really a mix of all these um, um, methods together. And um, that's why it's more uh, exploratory uh, research than it is, um, it's, it's like a, a step one research for future research. So um, this is uh, an example of uh, the study that is today um, in the field. This is the English version. I have the English and the Arabic version. And um, so um, as you can see here, um, this is the condition of instruction. So basically it tells um, the participant uh, what is um, uh, the, their views of the prototypical Lebanese Sunni. And they choose between disagree, neutral, or agree. And this is, for example, one statement. The next thing, this is the Arab version, is that they rank, or they rank order those in three columns. They drag and drop them one compared to the other between uh, uh, minus seven to plus seven on this uh, curve. And the final curve would look something like this. This will allow me basically to do statistical analysis on it. So where did I get my statements from? This is the Q set. I used um, the, uh, a shorter uh, scale version uh, of the SDO, the social dominance orientation, which is more economic and how groups dominate one another. And I used also um, a short version of um, the right-wing authoritarianism scale. And um, I used statements that I collected from paper clippings or qualitative interviews that I did in 2015. So each participant had two Q-sorts to do, and uh, the first Q-sort asked them about their in-group members' view of, ideology, of, um, of Lebanese politics, and the second group, um, and the second Q-sort was randomly assigned to ask them about one of the other uh, two groups. Um, I had six non-random participants, so as I said, this is exploratory, and it is um, very uh, uh, recommended to uh, not choose random, part uh, uh, random participants because you want to try to um, capture uh, the spectrum of opinion in, um, in the population. And since every uh, participant did two Q sorts, I have 120 Q sorts. And since uh, it was randomly assigned, I have roughly 40 um, um, uh, sorts for every uh, group. I have it in English and Arabic, and I have 64 uh, statements, and it's currently in the field. So uh, what kind of analysis did I do on this data? Or will I be doing on this data? I did the analysis on mock data to show you how it's going to look, but the data is still in the field. So I did not do a regular factor analysis. A regular factor analysis is a, um, a <laughs> extracts factors that are multiple uh, 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 observed variables uh, that basically are multiple observed variables with similar patterns of responses. A latent class analysis, someone talked about it yesterday in, in this room, uses survey questions and irregular factor analysis to reveal patterns of responses. A Q-factor analysis instead is an inverted um, kind of uh, matrix and the data collection uh, technique is not survey and uh, what it does is um, it uh, factors multiple of people, not variable, with similar patterns of responses into subgroups with a narrative, which is the ideological narrative that I'm looking for. And how many uh, analyses did I do? I did four. One on the Sunni group uh, on its own, one on the Shia, one on the Christians, and one on the Lebanese all combined. So four of them. But the data is still in the field, but I have mock data. So since the, the uh, research is not done, I don't have a conclusion, but I have expected findings. So for each sect, I expect um, to have um, liberal and conservative subgroups, which, is, which are factors. In addition, uh, I expect the conservative viewpoints to have more sectarian um, viewpoints enmeshed in the factors. And the liberal ones, I expect them to be mostly liberal. For the Lebanese polity overall, when I put all the sects combined, I expect um, 
first that um, I'll have more conservative factors than liberal factors, and the same trend as before. So more conservative Lebanese share sectarian viewpoints, and the, and the liberal ones uh, share liberal beliefs. So um, I have mock data. I have mock data on 37 sorts. So these are the sorts, 37 sorts here, and this is the correlation. And as you can see, since it's mock data, the correlation is really weak. I had only five real participants that were Christian and two that were Sunni, but the correlation, as you can see, is weak. And I had two factors, and they only accounted for 30% of the um, variation. The other 30 sorts were me testing the system and playing with the data, so therefore, the data is meaningless. But basically, you put all the um, um, normal curves, one on top of the other, and you should look for darker patterns more on the, um, on the extremities of the curve. As you can see, there isn't, it's, it's not really dark here. And anything that is in between is close to zero is not something that usually people pay attention to. So they look more at the plus seven and the minus seven. So the mock data, for example, uh, th that was the plus four, because this, these were darker than the rest. Um, these are the, um, the um, mm, statements that I thought were more liberal. Those, that are, those are the statements that were more um, uh, conservative. And the one in the middle is the more Lebanese um, statement that I can only um, analyze once I have all the factors in real life because I'm gonna analyze them one compared to the other in a, in a more ideological um, narrative. So this is the, um, the negative, those were the positive, those are the negative. So what about generalizability? As I said, this is not a random sample, which means no statistical inference is possible. However, um, what this um, uh, technique gives me is a relationship between factors and the type of groups. And this is important for me because um, in my next study, um, I will, uh, this is an exploratory uh, study, as I said, in the future, I will use those um, ideological narratives and uh, of subgroups in, um, in, in survey data that is random, and I will extract um, uh, the factors, and then my final aim is to develop a sectarian scale. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Damien Doyle. He's a PhD candidate at the Australian National University. Uh, he'll be speaking about the topic of the Sudras trend and the development of Iraqi civil society. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to be last cab off the rank this afternoon. As you can see, the topic of my talk this afternoon is Akhata Sadri, the, uh, the Sadrist line, um, a social movement that's active in, in Iraq. And the, the starting point for my paper this afternoon is the dramatic uh, mass demonstrations that occurred in 2016, in early 2016, involving both the Sadrist line and other civil society actors, which culminated in the symbolic infiltration of the Green Zone in Baghdad. This was a high point in contentious politics that have been a feature of Iraqi civil society uh, since 2003. In fact, even this afternoon, once again, um, an alliance of civil society groups are engaged in protests, not only in Baghdad, but also in Basra and in, in countless other cities across the country. Um, advancing a pro-reform agenda, just as they've done every Friday for, for many years. During the Green Zone infiltration last year, the Sutterist line demonstrated its mass mobilising capability, 
and its close collaboration with other civil society groups on the basis of shared values and shared objectives. And I think what's most significant for this afternoon's discussion and, and the broader themes of social justice that this conference is looking at is that following the Green Zone infiltration, there was a, a lessons learned workshop involving civil society groups who'd been involved, including the Sutterist Line. Sutterist activists came along and talked about how they managed to scale the concrete walls, uh, how they'd used social media to organise their activities, and what tactics they could employ to continue escalating their contentious action in the coming months. So I've got two, two aims this afternoon. The first is to introduce my PhD research project, which will set the scene for the discussion about the Sutterist line in civil society. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll explore the relationship between the Sutterist line and other civil society groups. My talk will draw on my preliminary findings um, from my PhD research project. A lot of this will be based on qualitative interviews, which have been conducted online, um, online engagement with activists to, to get access to the movement, um, and, and discourse analysis, which you'll, you'll see is, is quite relevant. In an earlier version of this paper, I didn't provide any key terms, and I launched straight into some really exciting stuff with nice photos. Um, so I'll run through some key terms for those of you who aren't familiar with social movement theory, which is what my thesis is engaging with. Essentially, the Sutterist line, in, in my view, should be considered a social movement because it displays the characteristics of what are broadly considered social movements uh, should be. It has a political agenda, it has a collective identity, quite a strong one, and it uses informal mobilising networks. It also does a lot of other things, um, which, we'll, which we'll talk about as well. Social movement theory, obviously, is the, is the very broad set of analytical tools and theoretical frameworks you can use to understand a social movement. And these two terms here are tools from the social movement theory toolbox, which I am using in my work to help explain how the Sutterist line operates and how it continues to maintain its relevance in Iraqi politics. The first is what the Sutterist Line leadership and activists do to frame uh, their political program. And the second, the opportunity structure, is the context in which they're working. And for my research, what I think is most important is not so much the formal political structures that they're working with, although that is a part, but the discursive opportunity, so the, the debates and the ideas that circulate in Iraqi politics in society, which create opportunities for the Sutterist line to demonstrate that it has something to contribute. There are numerous other social movement tools which are relevant, and I'll, I'll touch on them only very lightly, such as social movement diffusion, um, which, which is the way social <coughs> movements share knowledge and learnings with each other. Um, through, through uh, contact with other groups or perhaps lessons learned in other contexts. And also the idea of a repertoire of contention, which is the, the series of actions or activities that a social movement has at its disposal. Um, for those who don't know about the Sutterist line, uh, a quick introduction. It's organisationally complex. It has a parliamentary bloc, it has an armed group, which is currently firewalled from other parts of the organised, or other parts of the movement, but wasn't always. Um, it's politically complex, it's difficult for outside observers to understand. It seems to have shifting goals and, and objectives and shifting alliances. Sometimes it's seen as a proxy of Iranian interests, other times it's seen as a nationalist force. Um, and it's resilient, despite uh, a number of setbacks since 2003 when it emerged in its current form. Um, it suffered setback after setback only to re-emerge again later. And, and the Green Zone infiltration last year was one example of that resilience. The current figurehead of the Sadoist line, Muqtada Sada, uh, comes from a, a long line of um, respected Shia uh, clerics. And I won't, I won't spend too much time on this, but it's important to recognise that this, um, 
this clerical family, which provides a, a titular and symbolic figurehead for the movement, has um, has a long history, and uh, and you'll see some of these these names and faces appear in in photos later on. And I could spend twenty minutes just talking about that. So in order to work out um, how the Satirist line operates and what its goals are, I'm using social movement theory and my focus question um, relates to the collective action frame of the Satirist line. What is it, how does it work and how does it change over time? And there's a series of supporting questions I've got there and, and the main thrust of that is I'm not only concerned with the leadership and the way that it constructs its collective action frame, but also the way that that frame is received and interpreted by its constituents, by activists and participants and other Iraqis who are also an audience for the messages that the movement sends out. And the main social movement theory tools that we'll be discussing uh, the collective action frame and its three main functions, which are to diagnose a social or political problem, offer a prognosis about how that can be solved, and then motivate people to take action. Um, the political and discursive opportunity structures are, as I said before, the context, um, and I'm focused more on the discursive than the political, and social movement diffusion, which we'll get into. So my hypothesis at this point in the project is that the Sutterus Line's collective action frame is really adaptable. It's made up of three malleable and richly symbolic elements which can be reconfigured uh, to fit in with whatever opportunities are present in the discursive structures of Iraqi society and politics. So what that means is that the Sutterus Line can demonstrate that it has continuing relevance. So what are these three elements? The first is religious, and it's about um, the clerical authority of the Sutter family. It's about um, Shia political activism and, and traditions in, the, in that stream. And it's all bound up uh, quite often in the legacy of Hussein as a reformer and as this great uh, patron whom Sutterists can follow today. The second element is nationalism, and this is really important. Um, the Sutterist line today distinguishes itself from other political actors and other civil society groups by stressing that it is Iraqi. It was always Iraqi, it was always there during the sanctions, during the bath, uh, during the occupation, and it is not attached to foreign interests. And the third element is social justice, and it can take on a different tone depending upon what is happening in the discursive opportunity structure. At the moment, the main focus is on corruption, and in particular, it's on the links between terrorism and corruption and the so-called uh, sectarian quota system that Iraqi politics is based on. The Sadrists and the other civil society groups with which they collaborate have a very sophisticated critique of the current system which says that the US fostered a sectarian quota system. It entrenched corruption. Entrenched corruption means that government doesn't function properly and we're therefore vulnerable to terrorism. My work involves um, doing a discourse analysis to understand the discursive opportunity structure uh, in Iraq and also to understand the way that the Sutterist line sends out messages within that. And these are the key themes um, that, that dominate discussions in Iraq today. Corruption, as I just mentioned, government service delivery, the protest movement which really kicked into high gear during 2015 and eventually culminated in the green zone infiltration, started during summer when there was no electricity and water supplies were unreliable. Terrorism is also a theme. Social justice more broadly, particularly when um, the connection is made in the minds of Iraqis between uh, government's inability to provide security in Baghdad and terrorist bombings and the fact that the families of victims don't get any justice. And you can see that represented in the, in the image there. And then finally Iraqi nationalism and this is becoming more important now as the the ground war against the Islamic State group appears to be reaching its climax and there's a, a great discussion in Iraq about national unity. 
In the next couple of slides, I'll just show uh, some images that sort of exemplify the way that the Sutterus line can reshape its message and its brand in order to fit in with what's going on discursively. So here we see an appeal to the discussion about terrorism um, and about security. And Muqtada Rasada, um, who would customarily be, displaying, be shown in clerical attire, is instead dressed as a, as a warrior fighting terrorists. And these images here were, were circulated online last year by activists to mobilise people and, and, more importantly, to send a message to other Iraqis and to international audiences about the escalation of their non-violent campaign to call for political reform. But now that I've set the scene, I want to quickly introduce um, Iraqi civil society as a, as a concept um, and what some of its characteristics are. And then we'll talk about how the, how the Sardarist line is engaging with other civil society actors. Iraqi civil society should be conceived of as a political space. Um, and I, think, I think these characteristics will be common to, to other areas, um, other countries in the region. Importantly for, for my work and for our discussion this afternoon, it's a space for both contention and collaboration. So social movements and civil society actors can certainly engage in uh, claim making. They can make claims on the state for the people that they represent and the interests that they represent. But they can also make uh, claims on each other and they can contest with other civil society groups or they can collaborate with other civil society groups. And a lot of that goes on. And unlike Western conceptions of civil society, um, there's both formal and informal actors. There's a plurality of both indigenous, say, ethnic or religious groups, and also civic or secular types of groups. And they all have varying degrees of social and political independence. Um, a, lot of, a lot of NGOs are attached to political parties. A lot of social service type organisations, which appear to be not-for-profits, are attached to um, religious institutions, and so on. And, and Iraqis accept that this is, this is the way things happen. Iraqi civil society today has a, a vast array of interests that it represents and makes claims on. And this is a, a list of some of the things that are currently a focus of different campaigns across um, civil society today. I guess some examples would be um, the work of the organisation Masarat, um, on, on minorities' rights, the Organisation for Women's Freedom in Iraq, which supports uh, women who've been displaced by conflict, women who are victims of um, sexual violence, the Iraqi Civil Society Solidarity Initiative, which organises the annual Iraqi Social Forum and also puts on events which are intended to attract international solidarity from other uh, civil society groups. And all of these different campaigns involve a lot of different things. So there's protests in the streets, there are petitions, there are workshops, um, and there are all types of um, programs that occur in universities or in hotel conference rooms. And the last of those is the political reform protest movement. So the interaction between the Sutterist line and other civil society groups in the, in the reform protest, the pro-reform protest movement, is, is about more than just turning up on the day. There's an organising committee uh, established a couple of years ago, which has a broad membership from both civil society groups, secular or civic civil society groups, and the Sutterist line. Its membership is elected and it changes from time to time and there's often hot debate about who will be on the committee. And the committee has debates about tactics and strategy. But underpinning this collaboration are the common objectives of the Sutterist line and the civil society groups with which it interacts. In uh, September last year, I had a conversation with a Sutterist activist who, since the Green Zone infiltration, had been involved in a number of different workshops and behind closed doors kind of activities involving other civil society groups that weren't highly publicised. And at the time that I spoke to him, he was preparing to, to go to the Iraqi Social Forum, where, again, he would be engaging with members of, of other civil society groups. And so I asked him to explain to me what he thought about the collaboration between the Sutterists and, and other groups. 
and you can, you can see what he was telling me. He stressed that there are common values and common goals and that the civic activists are just as keen to sacrifice themselves in the interests of the country as the Sutterist line are. And importantly, he said to me that he recognised that the most active members within the civic trend or the civic current um, were those descended from the Iraqi Communist Party. And he didn't seem to have any problem with that uh, because they have common goals. So just this month there have been, um, there's been a fair bit of activity um, to kind of strengthen the collaboration between the Sutterist line and, and the secular groups. And you can see the very interesting statement from Muqtada Sada there, um, where he says that our, our goal is not to Islamise um, the, the civil current, but to civilise the Islamist current. And this is a reference to, to criticisms of the Sutterist line um, from groups who say that they're hijacking the protest movement for their own political reasons, which, which may be valid. And the other image there is, is two key figures from the pro-reform protest movement, um, both, both secular figures, meeting with Muqtada Sada. It's not all, all roses, and there are some underlying uh, difficulties in the relationship between the Sutterist line and, and other groups. And the first is about their vision of a future Iraqi state. Or the key players in the secular elements of the pro-reform protest movement. A future Iraqi state will be secular, and it will be based on citizenship, and it will be geared towards the satisfaction of human needs. And, and these groups have got together and articulated a set of principles which they believe should underpin a post-sectarian uh, quota system order in Iraq. For the Sutterists, a lot of the principles, um, are, are, they agree with a lot of the principles, but their vision is ultimately for an Islamic state. And what form that takes is quite ambiguous and is not really set down clearly anywhere. So this leads to a fair bit of discord among uh, civic uh, groups who, not, who are not sure if they can trust the Sutterists over, over the long term. And the second big issue there is about corruption. Quite often at these joint events when Sutterists turn up to, or Sutterist activists turn up to engage with their counterparts, they are criticised for being hypocrites. Um, their parliamentary bloc is as corrupt as those that they say they oppose in government. Uh, members of their own movement are corrupt and engage in corrupt activities. And in response to this, the Sutterist line in, in early 2015, uh, 2016 established an internal corruption commission, which from time to time uh, makes issues statements which eject um, people from the movement and, um, and outline the reasons that they've brought the movement into disrepute. So there are a number of unresolved tensions. Will they establish a party? There are some academics in Iraq who advance an idea of a, a unified historic bloc which um, will form a mass party and help move the reform project along. There's the asymmetry of power relations, which it, with the experience of, of the Egyptian revolution, Iraqi secularists are likely to be fearful of aligning themselves with a much more powerful um, um, Islamist group. But at the moment, I guess, the key point of contention between all these groups is, the, is what's illustrated here, um, Shala Kala, and I'm not sure if this is a, a Lebanese um, idea as well. In Iraqi, in Iraqi slang, Shala Kala is what the dentist does to you. It's, it means pulling and gouging. And this is the phrase which has been used to explain the escalating nonviolent street protests. It's gonna hurt. Um, but we need to remove the tooth and at first we'll, we'll pull it and if it doesn't come out then we'll get the tools and we'll gouge it but we're not going to let up until the tooth is removed. The tooth is corruption and, and the goal is the health of, of the Iraqi body. So in this brief discussion, I've introduced you to my PhD research project and the way that I conceptualise the Sutterist line as a social movement with a really sophisticated collective action frame, which it uses to, in to demonstrate its enduring relevance to Iraqi politics. 
At the moment, the Sutterist Lion is in a close collaboration with other civil society actors in Iraq, but there are a number of tensions underlying that relationship. Activists tell me that they share common goals and common values with other civil society actors, but there are debates about whether this collaboration can lead to the formation of a political party, whether the campaign should be escalated or, or continue on its nonviolent path. Um, and on the details of what a future Iraqi state should look like. And that, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you all. Um, we have some uh, very wide ranging topics for this session. Uh, we have about uh, 25 uh, minutes uh, for Q&A comments, so I will open up the floor. Uh, we have a microphone over there. Yes. Do you mind just also introduce yourself before yes. you? Um, Leia Abu Khater. I recently completed my PhD uh, on the workers' movement in Lebanon, um, starting like from the war, from the outbreak, from the outbreak of the war. I am actually. I wanted to ask Rosano on the common lens or the lens to use the perspective or approach to examine the three case studies or the, I don't know if you mentioned them before, but I arrived two, two, uh, two minutes late. And also, what is the common thread that we find in all these cases? The common? Thread. Thread? thread? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and when we got to the conclusion, I wanted actually to know more. Yes, we know that there's a struggle between the labor and the state. And isn't it like almost a fatality? We know that. Maybe we want to know more. What or how did the state and the elite cartel in Lebanon manage to tame the workers' movement from outset to onset, we can say? How did they manage to keep it under control, whether it's formal and informal, whether it's private sector, uh, public sector? How did they do it? Um, Maybe a focus on how institutions, how the law was used um, to tame the workers' movement, and how and what does this tell us? This um, the strategies that the state has uh, used. What does it tell us about the workers' movement? Um, what does it tell us about the labor struggle? Does it does it mean that this struggle is the passé that the workers' movement or the labor movement is the passé? Or does it tell us that the state has been winning the struggle? We need to focus more about how did, the, how did the state and the elite manage to do this? Thank you. Up there, uh, Dr. Sami Faish, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a few questions for Bari'a. Um, and this is, in fact, in a sense, a response to your uh, call for a critique of your uh, arguments. Um, first point, um, although I agree with some of the major points that you brought in the conceptualization, including the idea of constructivism in this sense, I'm not sure this drives me to accept the idea that you want to look at a sect as a unit of analysis and try to address it as such. Sect as a unit of analysis in a sense, I think this is predominant in the way you're making the presentation. You're considering it in one way or another, a sectarian community as being, in a sense, something new to look at, uh, although you had suggested that there may be disagreements within the, uh, the sectarian community. Second point associated with that is that the way you're dividing people, or you said subgroups within the sectarian community as being what's called left and right. Left in the sense being uh, con uh, being liberals, and I mean, I have problem with the left equal to liberal in this sense, and right as being conservative. And then, of course, what is exactly in this sense left and right mean conservative and liberals? Um, of course, I'm not trying to suggest, I mean, you may not find um, people in a, w within a certain community, again, my question is regarding w whether it's a unit of analysis or not, as being liberals or conservative, but then you use the term subgroups. And I'm curious about what subgroups would be in this sense. Would the subgroup be, let's say, a political party or political organization? It's not. 
Should I answer now? Uh, let's wait until we get. Okay. So then, of course, it's not a political organization, political group. Then, of course, want to find out what would be a subgroup in this sense. Okay. What would bring people together uh, within the same sectarian community with the assumption that they're sectarian, in a sense, because I think that's what I, you had suggested, and them being what's called left or what's called right. Okay. I just want to raise these questions. Okay. Take one more question here before going back to the speakers. Uh, my question is to Mr. Damian Doyle. Um, I wonder how could you consider the Sadri line as a civil society group? Because my definition of civil society is that it does not resort to violence. And uh, well, you have indicated that uh, there are armed groups within the Sadri line. And we know also from newspapers that they have committed atrocities against the Sunnis, maybe uh, Muqtada Sadr himself, you know, sounds uh, I don't know, um, more inclusive in his uh, speeches, uh, but uh, I think there are serious uh, accusations uh, against the Sadri line that it was really committing uh, atrocities against Sunnis. Uh, so <laughs> this does not accord uh, with a definition of civil society because, you know, it should be civil, not in the sense that it is not military, it of course means that it is, does not contain any military formations, but it is civil in the sense that it acts in a civilized manner. So, you know, how can you deal with this problem? Uh, do you want to go ahead and start with that question and then we'll go to Baria? And... It's a good question. And, and I think it's a question that Muqtada Sada and, and his key organizers and activists are dealing with as well. So, when you talk to um, Sadrist activists in Baghdad today, their primary concern is corruption um, and the reform program and security in Baghdad, particularly in Sadr City, which is frequently targeted by the Islamic State group. From the outside, though, the focus is often on uh, Saraya as Salam, or before that, the Medi Army, um, or on, on the political manoeuvrings of Muqtada Sadr. And I think that this is part of the, the reframing that the movement has gone through, uh, particularly since 2008. Um, they've created a new armed group which is much more professionalised than, than the previous militia was. And there's a, there's a really is a firewall organisationally between activists who participate in contentious action in the streets um, and go to workshops at universities and and the soldiers who train and volunteer um, in the name of the shrine protection narrative and head north to defend Samara or to, or to fight. Um, but it's a difficulty and, and, it's, and it opens the, the movement to criticism and it really restrains its ability to, to engage in politics. And I think that's why there is so much emphasis now on this collaboration with other groups to demonstrate that, look, the fighting is happening, but that's justified because we're defending the nation against terrorism. We made mistakes in the past, but look, we've made a clean start. Meanwhile, we here are um, engaged in, in all the same issues that every other Iraqi is. And because of the, your very question, they're going through this, this process of, of reorientation. Thank you, Dr. Sami, for your question. I don't know how to answer it without going back to my, uh, to my design. Um, if you recall, before um, a participant uh, um, takes um, uh, uh, or, or uh, starts the sort, um, I don't know if I mentioned that, but there is a demographic section. So they fill their sect, so I know which sect they come from, but when they are uh, doing the task itself, it's mainly looking at their um, um, right-left predispositions depending on um, the SDO, as I said in my presentation, and RWA. And I also have included certain um, certain uh, Lebanese uh, contextual sectarian uh, statements. Uh, what I um, mean by subgroup uh, is, although, for example, um, um, I will have 40 Shias that have done this, um, this um, uh, uh, task, I, I'm expecting to find maybe four groups of Shias, and I would like to compare these four groups to the other four groups of Sunnis and see how, on the right-left dimension, they are similar or different. So basically, these subgroups are not political parties. I am studying ideology as residing within the individual, as I said earlier. So it's not... A, the leaders, like, for example, 
uh, Hariri or Nabih Berri, they are, act as signposts for, for ideology, but as I said, um, uh, I'm studying the individual ideology, which means consciously or subconsciously people choose what to take from the ideology that is presented to them by, by the leader. They're, this is what I'm trying to capture. What is the residual ideology within the society and how in the future I can have um, uh, surveys to be able to structure my, my scale, my sectarianism scale. Did I answer your question? Why do you want to compare the Sunni and the Shia on whether they are liberals or they're conservatives on this kind of a scale? I mean, what, what advantage would you have? What, what is the benefit of comparing them as such? So, uh, I, mean, I mean, would this suggest that the Sunni, let's say, would be, in the overall sense, more liberal than the Shia or vice versa? No, it would not. On the contrary, it would suggest that some Sunnis are more liberal and some Shias are more, more liberal, and the difference is within the sect, just like it is within the community. So what I'm, say, what I'm looking for is within sect variation. Okay. But then I want to go back into this kind of a division between uh, uh, liberal meaning, uh, uh, right meaning liberal and left being, uh, being conservative. And this is probably something that I would really want to think about and probably you want to suggest or think about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I think it, uh, just because it's a much longer conversation, what we'll do is we'll stop there. Maybe you can talk afterwards and, and then we'll go to Rosanna. Um, uh, well, uh, with regards to my approach, I've used the eclectic approach of uh, an historian temporarily borrowed to social sciences. So <clears throat> I mostly relied my analysis uh, on the discourse analysis, uh, to, on the analysis of uh, the change in the political discourse of the Lebanese government or of the various actors involved alongside the dispute, the, to then relate it uh, yeah, with the funding characteristics of Lebanese power structure. And then try to make these two levels dialogue, this, those sort of discontinues, and then try to find a sense from it. So basically this has been my methodology. Uh, but how do the state manage uh, its labor relations? Well, <coughs> um, what I've provided today is just uh, one example of the number of forms through which uh, Lebanese state has managed the labor conflict, especially both. Uh, synchronically and diachronically. I didn't have the time to develop to develop this subject just for question of times. So I've done it uh, in the paper and in general we can say that the various form uh, that the state management has assumed towards workers has been um, o o open repression in some cases, legal control through the labor law uh, as you were mentioning, which in fact has played a major role for the failure of those three disputes. The cooptation of the labor movement, which has occurred especially uh, alongside the 90s, and uh, repressive integrity, uh, and uh, what we may call the, a mechanism of uh, repressive integration of labor conflict. Uh, so the, the attempt that sometimes revealed successful, some other times did not reveal successful by political leaders to take um, the leadership of a movement, impose themselves as main representative of those workers and then deconflictualize the, the, the them and that simultaneously turn them into uh, a crucial part of their constituencies. That actually it's a bit the mechanism that worked with ADL daily, daily workers and AMA movement, for instance. 
and to a certain extent also the, the, the opposition shown by the free patriotic movement, movement because um, we didn't have time to go that much in detail, but uh, for instance, uh, Gibran Basile especially um, uh, frameworked his opposition to the full time um, hiring for all uh, daily workers, uh, hanging on the idea of the defense of the Christian rights as uh, <coughs> affirmed by the Taif agreements vis a vis an allegedly over representation of Shias within Adel. So, uh, to investigate such a phenomenon would require a parallel to the conference to be exhaustively. <laughs> What does that of the labor movement? <coughs> well, it tells us that while alive, it, uh, it needs to seriously thinking how to cope with a narrower and, and narrower space of uh, political action that such an articulation of the Lebanese power system has left them. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, we'll take another round of hands. Yes, over there. I'm Sarah Marusik, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Johannesburg. I have questions um, for Baria. Pretty much following up on this, I, I do also urge you to rethink the right left um, uh, linear sort of uh, scale in which to measure people's. I don't know if it even works in the United States. Honestly, it, it's, it's something that really needs to be um, problematized. I mean, even if you do adopt it, to really critically do so and, and really explore what problems there may be. I know there's been a lot of work on how it doesn't actually fit into Middle Eastern politics. Um, and then also similarly with, with your notion of ideology, I've actually never met anyone with a coherent ideology. Um, really, like, I, I mean, I can understand, I, I think your explanation um, just now was actually uh, more enlightening and it, act it made me appreciate what you're trying to do a little bit more. But I think ideology is something that is very contested. It's me messed up, mixed up. And I think it also cannot be confined to the individual. Your relationships with other people, with your community, who you are in society, um, your positionality really also influences heavily your ideology. Um, but I think, you know, you, you can isolate it to measure it in certain ways, but since you do have these really wonderful um, qualitative interviews, I think you can use that, you, maybe you can use that section to sort of problematize some of these things and say, this is what I did in order to make these measurements for the qual quantitative analysis, but here in the qualitative you see some of the nuances and maybe you can tease some of this out and that could actually make a really, um, really interesting project. Um, and then my other question was for Damien. I think your, your research sounds really interesting, especially because I haven't actually um, had access to anything in English that does something um, trying to, um, I don't know, look at a movement that's so demonized in the West. Um, I, but I also want to push back with this, um, th this idea that what they say is actually what they do. Um, I think it's a methodological problem for you because you're doing online research. I mean, I've done a lot of work, for example, with like Muslim movements or uh, leftist movements that have the most wonderful discourses on women's rights. And at the end of the day, we're always pushed to the side and marginalized. You know, people say the right things because they're expected to, um, but it's not necessarily how it plays out on the ground. And if you can build something in your, um, in your methods, I don't know how it would be because you're doing things online. If you have informants on the ground, um, how, I mean, part of the problem is, is a lot of the, the informants will be, um, affected by the politics and sectarianism, and so it's going to be hard to have them be reliable, but I don't know if you can actually go there um, or do something. You have to figure out methodologically how you might be able to solve this problem, because I think it's going to keep coming up, and unfortunately, because of the research hard, is hard to do online, it's going to be even harder. Floor's open. One last chance, and then we're just going to take it back to the speakers. Uh, and just a note on programming: right after this particular uh, session, we're going to have closing remarks. We're not going to have a closing uh, roundtable, as it uh, says in the program. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Manny Jamal to uh, join me to just say a few thank yous and a few remarks about the collaboration that we've had here. So uh, that'll be at exactly at 5.30. So if there isn't any more questions, 
we're going to go back and give the opportunity to all of the speakers to just uh, uh, say any final words they, they want to. You want to start? It was a there. question, but I, maybe I will add something. So um, you, you said that uh, the right-left uh, uh, dimension um, does not apply uh, to the to Middle Eastern politics, and um, what I'm trying to do is use um, more uh, economic and uh, cultural um, um, statements uh, that um, that lead to. Um, that basically define a, a more conservative belief uh, or, or ideology or political uh, ideology and uh, um, or, or liberal or, or conservative. So that would um, basically help me um, um, in analyzing the factors the, that will come out of my study. So when I have uh, factors that have um, right uh, statements and sectarian statements, it will give me a direction of how to understand the statement. I'm using it uh, more as a pointer to what what I'll be finding will mean. And if it's not valuable, as I said, it will be around the mean, so it will not figure out in my research. So um, I think it's a nice exploratory uh, tool to be able to say what is important in Lebanese politics and what is not. And if it's not, I, have, I would have tried. But thank you. Uh, yeah, um, what uh, I didn't mention or uh, highlight in my presentation that the nine cases that were brought before the court, uh, the people uh, hired a lawyers and uh, the cases cost them so much. I didn't mention the numbers are in the, the, the study. So what I'm, I'm trying to say here that uh, the lack of pro bono institution that enhance or help Palestinians to to have access to justice is worse than their economic situation, which they are poor and uh, this situation is uh, increasing the state of poverty uh, among Palestinian refugees in the camps. I'm also a couple of things about um, Sarah's remarks because uh, I, I could I could give a 20 minute paper on the on the ethical conundrums that I face. Um, and, and you're right that it's a, a social movement that or. or Whatever, whatever it turns out to be, that has um, a really bad reputation, and um, and I expected to be less accessible um, than I've been lucky enough to find out that it is. But that's part of the problem. So um, I have a number of gatekeepers who are my initial points of contact within the movement, and I have to be wary that they don't just direct me towards sources of information that um, act as a PR mechanism for them, um, and that. They don't deny me the chance to talk to people who might say something that they wouldn't like me to hear. Um, and there are, there are a number of other difficulties there as well. Um, I'm predominantly dealing with, with activists in Baghdad, but I'm not dealing with, with poor, um, marginalised families from Sutter City who only take part in the movement when they go to the mosque on Friday and then go to a protest afterwards. I'm talking to people who are coming up with an ideological program and, and organising protests and that type of thing. Luckily, the Australian National University Ethics Committee is helping me um, with my research design, and they've been extremely critical of my initial plan, which was for a, um, a type of ethnography, which a political ethnography with the activists in Baghdad in short, short blocks of time to manage security. Uh, but it looks like it's going to increasingly be mostly online. Um, and so I guess what I need to do is try to try to build in some tests and controls for that. So speaking at events like this is is one of those to test my own credulity and make sure that I'm not captured um, by the by the people that I'm studying, um, and also to talk to the Iraqi diaspora in Australia um, and and elsewhere, and they have some very critical views of of the Sutterus line. Um, yeah, so it is it is really really tricky and. Um, I guess the way that this will be, this policy, this this um, this methodological problem will be ex expressed in my thesis in in having two parts. One where I try to present the worldview of Sutterist activists, the meaning that they make of their of their activity and what their movement means to them, and the other where I'm critical of that, um, and and that's I guess the only way I can get around it. Um, well, act 
actually what uh, I was hoping to add with in case of an extra time has already emerged in, from the question and answer so thank you and good evening <laughs> great uh, help me thank all the speakers to, for the session